Welcome back to Municipal Month on the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am pleased and honored to have our guest on for the show. And not only because he is a elected representative here in the city of Calgary, but he's also my elected representative, uh, Ward 10 City Councilor for the city of Calgary, Councilor Andre Chabot. Councilor, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure. No problem. It's my honor. Thanks for having me on your show, Chris. So, <laughs> Councillor, I've asked this question to every level of elected official who's come on my show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Councillor? Um, well, you know what? It was it was instilled in me at a very early age. Um, uh, I was I was born in Saskatchewan, and because I was I was uh, born in January, the cutoff in Saskatchewan to start school is the end of December. And so I, I turned six in January uh, of, of whatever year that was. Uh, but, you know, I was, uh, I was a very curious young fellow and always looking to do things. And my mom decided that uh, to keep me out of trouble, she would uh, enroll me in different things, including uh, being an altar boy and, and, uh, and a Boy Scout. Uh, so I, I served as a Boy Scout um, doing all kinds of volunteer stuff uh, and, and served as an altar boy serving mass every day uh, with, uh, with the priest there uh, with, uh, at the nun's convent and then subsequently at the, at the church uh, before I started school. So, so the sense of serving um, was something that was instilled in me in a very young age. Uh, from there, from, uh, you know, going serving mass and, and working as, a, or actually doing volunteer stuff as a, as a Boy Scout, uh, when we moved to the city of Calgary, of course, uh, then I got involved in cadets uh, and, and of course, at the community level, serving, uh, you know, doing volunteer work. And then uh, later on, as I was getting older with, uh, with my own children, uh, of course, volunteering at the community level to subsidize some of the programs that my kids were involved in and, and actually getting subsidies to support my, my kids' dancing activities, dance classes. I have four girls, in case you didn't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, I uh, living in a, in a farming community, um, especially a small farming community in Saskatchewan where I grew up, you know, everyone was always helping everyone. You know, it was such a small community. We were so well connected that you know, your, your neighbor was like a brother. And in fact, a lot of them were like brothers first cousins <laughs> but uh that's besides the point it, it just i don't know it it was very much uh, you know the whole you know western sort of based uh, persona that existed even in saskatchewan and, and the same with calgary when we moved here in, in 1971 that that small town feeling still existed here uh, and so i i carried you know those um, ideals and and uh, i guess learnings from my younger age here with me to Calgary, you know, give the shirt off your back to your neighbor if you feel that he needs it more than you kind of thing. And that's very much uh, aligned with the, the Western hospitality mentality that existed here, even though it was a, you know, a city of about, I don't know, 400,000 at the time. It was uh, <laughs> changed it was a lot since then. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure has. Um, I want to I want to talk about the entrance into the the political realm because duty to serve doesn't just come into play when it's political. It can be through volunteerism. It can be through organizations like the cadets or scouts. It can be in many different ways. But in 2004, you decided to put your hand into the ring for elected official. Um, you were unsuccessful in that election, but a by-election a year later, you did become the successful candidate for uh, your ward. I want to talk about that first election that you ran in. What was the issue that was prominent to you that you said, you know what, my duty to serve is to serve my community and to do that, I'm going to do it municipally. All right. Well, then I, then I'll have to correct you. Forgive me for, for doing uh -oh. so. Uh, uh oh, <laughs> because um, uh, of course I was always interested in politics and it was instilled in me as a young age when we had a discussion around the table and my dad, we were talking about the solar system. My dad made a statement. And I said, actually, Dad, that's factually incorrect, because I had just done a report in school on the solar system, and I corrected him. And, of course, he was not happy about being corrected at the table. And he said, what do you know? You're an 11-year-old kid. And, and again, I made a mistake of saying, 
Uh, well, Dad, uh, I, you're right. I, I don't know anywhere near as much as what you do, but on this particular subject, my source of reference is Encyclopedia Britannica. What's yours? <laughs> that was not a good thing to say, the what's yours part. But uh, when he is summarily uh, dismissed me from the table uh, and, and uh, you know, it was booting my butt, no pun intended, um, it's as he was sending me to my room and he said, if I was as smart as you, I'd be prime minister. And I thought to myself, if my dad thinks that being intelligent is somehow correlated to being an elected official, maybe I should continue to strive for excellence and knowledge and maybe pursue political uh, life uh, sometime in the future. So that essentially is what planted the seed in my brain. Oh, wow. Um, uh, and then, so every time I saw a politician, I would engage him in a conversation. And Ray Clark, who was my counselor uh, in Ward 10, of course, I lived in Forest Heights at the time, he, uh, he did a lot of door knocking. And, and when he would come around, I would engage him in conversation. And uh, in uh, about 1995, um, when he was running in that election, he said to me, he's like, uh, when we were talking at the door, he says, you know, he says, uh, you're, uh, you seem to be pretty keen on local events and what's going on in the world generally. He says, have you ever considered running for political office? I said, well, I have, of course, I've got small children. Uh, he says, well, I mean, municipally, I went, uh, you know what, it does very much interest me, but I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't even consider running in this area because you are, you know, so entrenched here and so well known that I wouldn't have a chance of, of winning against you. He says, well, I might not always be running for counselor. So if ever I decide not to, would you consider putting your name forward? I said, if you weren't running, yeah, absolutely. So in 1998, oh, wow. when he decided to run for mayor against uh, then Al Dewar, he, uh, I moved to Marlboro Park at the same time from Forest Heights. And I saw him at an event. Of course, I started getting involved in that community. And he saw me there, he goes, I remember you, I recognize you, but not here. So you're, you're out of context for me. Help me now remember why I know you. I said, well, I live in Forest Heights. We've had conversations. I live in Forest Oh, he says, I, rem I remember you. He says, didn't you say that if I wasn't running for municipal, for, for councillor or alderman at the time, that you would be willing to put your name forward? I said, yeah. I, I did. He says, well, I'm not sure if you've heard, but I've decided to throw my hat in the ring to run for mayor in the next election. I said, I did not know that. He says, so are you going to put your name forward? I said, well, uh, you know what? I said I would. So sure. Why not? He says that there's um, one person that's running right now. Uh, she's a former school board trustee. He says, I've had a chance to work with her. And I personally believe that you would be a better person to represent our city as, a, as an alderman so I think it would be it would be good for our city if you put your name forward to run uh, so that she just doesn't win by acclamation I said oh well I mean I'm not going to test you know the other candidates um, but you know what I said I would and so I will and so uh, that's that was my entry into into municipal uh, campaigning so in 1998 I lost to Diane Danielson uh, I came in second on, on a field of five. I ran again in 2001, uh, but it was only me and her. And I had, uh, I think I ended up with 42% against her. And of course, as you know, I ran in 2004 and uh, Margo Aftergood ended up winning that election, albeit that it was contested. Diane Danielson came in second and I came in third. At that time, of course, the media said, Andre, like, when are you going to stop running? This, he's like, you're like a third time loser, right? I'm like, yeah, you know what? You're right. And that was my failing. My failing in being able to connect with enough people and getting them to know who I am and what I'm about and why I think I'd be the best person to represent this part of the city. And, and I'm, I'm going to stop running when I manage to convince uh, enough people that I am the best candidate to represent this area. Uh, for, for you know for for a term so when i win essentially is when i'm going <laughs> to stop, stop running <laughs> so it's like wow well, okay all right and then of course when the by-election was called i decided that it i had had sort of a soft agreement with diane danielson that you know i wouldn't put i wouldn't run a really strong campaign 
that I would still run. So people knew that I was very much interested in the job, but that wouldn't put the same level of emphasis that I did in 2001, because truly I put everything into that election to try and defeat her. I ended up with 42%, but it's very disheartening when you put so much of yourself into an election and then you lose, you know, it's hard to, to move on from that and yeah. to even consider yeah. running again. And so that was the second time I've lost, of course. Um, so to run that third time, I'm like, you know what? I, I, I don't have the time or the inclination to put that much effort into this election because I put so much effort into the last one. And I know now that there's a third person which will likely further split, divide the vote, which means that my chances of success are, are even further diminished. No one saw what came. Uh, from uh, as far as the flurry from that other candidate uh, and the amount of uh, uh, exposure, media exposure, uh, advertisement, uh, like that candidate, you know, spent probably four times as much as, as both of us combined on their campaign and ended up wow. successfully, ended up winning, albeit that, you know, that, that person ended up resigning because of uh, contraventions to the Local Authorities Election Act or the, the willingness for the city to cover half her cost of her legal fees, I guess. So in 2005, the by-election is called, and now you are three-time, as you just said, three-time loser, and you say, okay, one more time, one more time, or was there a push to say, okay, Andre, this is your time. Okay. We're going to, we're going to put your, we're going to put our horses behind your cart and we're going to push you up the hill. What was it in 2005 that you said, okay, maybe this is the time for me. It, it was the outcome of the 2004 election that really pushed me to to really focus 100 in, percent into that election, and and it was the electorate that made that made that decision for me. They decided it was time for change, and and it was evident by the fact that they voted somebody else in, not the incumbent, like a two-term incumbent lost to somebody who had no real involvement in the community, but just put out a really strong campaign, which said to me. People wanted somebody else. And so my failing was not being out there enough in that 2004 election, because like I said, Diane and I had a, a bit of an understanding that she said, this is going to be my last term. If, if I'm successful in winning in the 2004 election, I will not run in 2007 and I will gladly endorse you, which is another incentive for me to go, you know what? okay, I've put so much effort into this. I'm not going to put out a strong effort in 2004. But like I said, neither of us expected what came out of the, 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 the campaign for the other individual. Anyways, having said all that, when, uh, when Diane lost, I went, okay, you know what? It's time. And I, so, so I spoke to my wife. I said, listen, honey, uh, we, need to, we need to work together as a team. We need to consider uh, my future into, into a new career. And, and I believe it's time. And so I'm willing to invest into our future to represent the interests of our constituents, which means that in order to, for me to run an effective campaign and not have to rely on donors, I'm going to need to cash in my RRS peeps and, you know, sp spend uh, uh, significantly more money to get the proper exposure to um, uh, increases my increase my chances of success because I think this is a, an investment in not only our future but the future of the community and I think it's time and she said all right I'm with you and uh, and so so I I did um, pay the taxes on that <laughs> on that <laughs> and basically uh, pushed out my uh, my my work um, and said I'm gonna you know just take a leave from my work and focus hundred percent on this campaign. And, and I spent, uh, you know, a good two months, all of January. This was a real tough time to campaign right in the middle of winter, uh, trying to put up signs in winter. Good luck. Middle uh, of winter and the beginning of the year when nobody is paying attention to anything because they just got through Christmas. <laughs> yeah. And an election. I mean, there was, there was uh, already voter fatigue at that time. Um, and uh, I think it was Mike Platt said, you know what, uh, War 10, voter apathy has been an ongoing issue where, you know, there was only like, uh, what did you say, 18% um, uh, to voter turnout uh, or 15% voter turnout in the 2004 election. He says, 
nobody's going to come out and vote to your point middle of winter voter apathy beginning of the year he says they'll be lucky if, if they can get 10 percent voter turnout well that upset a lot of people uh, and you know they, they took offense to that uh, and so i worked hard to try and get as many people out as i could i i was projecting a 25 percent turnout uh, based on on the amount of uh, feedback that i got at the door um I ended up, uh, we ended up with uh, only a slightly uh, uh, over 20% voter turnout, which again was a step up from the 2004 election. Believe it or not, a by-election, we had a higher turnout than the wow. actual election in 2004. Anyways, I had, uh, I had gone out and truly identified my support. And I was, I was conservative in, in my uh, assumptions on who I thought would support me. Uh, and, and I used a completely different approach I was very targeted in my in my uh, in my work, uh, so I I pretty much had a, a good idea on where I would have the greatest success, and I focused a lot of my efforts primarily in those areas. So it was a very strategic uh, campaign at the time, and I had identified I projected that I was going to get around uh, twenty five hundred votes based on what I had identified. Um, and, uh, of course, a lot of people had discounted me, including Nenshi, by the way, who was uh, a private citizen. But uh, I was going to say, he wasn't, a, he wasn't a mayor at the time, was he? No, he was writing for the Herald. And uh, he, uh, he came to one of the forums and he said, I have a question for the top three contenders, Diane Danielson, Dale Galbraith and Barry Lineman. Now, I want to know what your position is on this. Of course, he was talking about uh, inclusion and, and diversity and, and those kind of subjects. Uh, and I, after he asked the question, I said, Mr. Moderator, if I may interrupt for a moment before these three candidates answer this question, I have to tell you that while Mr. Nenshi here is of the opinion that these three individuals are the top three candidates, I, for one, and I believe uh, uh, the other candidates that are here before us all believe that we have a chance of winning this election. So I for, personally would like the opportunity to also answer the question. And I, I think, Mr. Moderator, it would only be fair if you offered that same opportunity to all the other candidates, notwithstanding what Mr. Nenshi wants. Yeah. <laughs> of course, he was just a private citizen at the time. <laughs> Anyways, everyone applauded me for it. Uh, in fact, uh, Diane Danielson, who was very much being berated and targeted in that forum, said to, to everyone there, she says, listen, it, it appears to me, based on the questions and the comments that I'm hearing from the audience, that there's a lot of you that really don't want to see me get back in. But let me be clear about one thing. If you're not going to support me, there's only one other person here that's worthy of supporting. And that's Andre Chabot. He's been involved in this community. He's been working hard, actively participating and wow. volunteering. Uh, and so if you're not going to vote for me, you know what? My suggestion to you is vote for Andre. I'm like, well, thank you. Do I pay you now or later? <laughs> Over the course of the campaign, every candidate at one form or another said, you know what? I think I'm the best person for the job, but if you're not going to vote for me, Andre. Everyone except one person, which was Barry Lindemann, who never backed me um, during the campaign. Um, but he got to know me over the course of the campaign. And towards the end, he wasn't bashing me at all. Uh, in fact, he was primarily focusing around his own strengths and what he would bring to the table. After the election, uh, I ran into him numerous times at different events. Uh, of course, he's a quadriplegic, as you may or may not know. Um, and, uh, and we had numerous chats, him and I, and, and we got along great. And he says, you know what, Andre? If I had known the kind of person that you were before I, I put my name forward to run. He says, I, I wouldn't have run against you. I think you were the better man. I think you were the best man for the job and, and thank you for everything that you do. And, and, and I think you're a really nice guy and I'm glad you won. I'm like, wow. Well, thank you, Barry. That's very kind of you. I, you know what? I'm honored for you to say that. I, I always try to strive to do my best, but I, I that wanted, is, that means so much to me. I want to turn to the, the day after the election because you are officially declared the counselor elect for your ward and you now have to go from the campaign to now holding the weight and responsibility 
of dictating and voting on budget measures that will influence and impact the citizens that you, uh, your neighbors, your family, your friends, your community associations. How much weight and responsibility did you put on yourself walking into that first council meeting as the new counselor for your ward to say to yourself, the decisions I'm about to make, the decisions that I'm about to vote on, I'm going to have to go and talk to my constituents right afterwards and say, this is why I voted, or this is why we need to raise your taxes 2% or 1% or 3% or 0%. Yeah, that was very tough, to be honest. Um, of course, as you, like as we talked about, I came in on a by-election. So um, there was essentially four months uh, prior to me that had no counselor. Over the course of that time, albeit that it the adjacent counselors were supposed to take off, you know, take on some of the responsibilities and the workload. Um, I got elected on Monday, February 28th, and had to be in council Monday, the following Monday, March the 5th or March the 6th. Um, so I, I had one week to clean out, all, pick up all my signs, clear out my campaign office, finalize my financials as much as possible get orientation from the city of Calgary, pick up my agenda, <laughs> read through the agenda and be ready to debate uh, on Monday morning. And as I, I said, March the 5th was when I first got sworn in and budget finalization was just around the corner. So to get up to speed, to try and get caught up on all the backlog and, and you know truly understand the role and responsibility that was before me was overwhelming overwhelming i can't tell you just how much it was drinking from the fire hose i know now people talk about it new counselors go oh yeah it's like drinking from the fire hose trust me it's not <laughs> <laughs> that was uh and so it it's, um it was very very hard and it did place a lot of weight on me uh i would say those that first six months dale hodges was just a, such a huge resource to me because I don't know if you know, Dale kept every every strip of paper that was ever in front of him, uh, never threw anything out. And he provided me with so much background information uh, to help me to make as educated a decision as possible with the limited amount of time that I had uh, on the budget. Of course, it didn't matter how much knowledge and research that I did, uh, because I voted in favor of the budget finalization. And to be clear, the budget was set in November, or as far as a municipal requirement. What we do in March is we get the requisition from the provincial government, we consolidate all of it, and then we vote on it. We vote on it on based on the consolidated total. Yeah. At that time, there is no opportunity to revisit the budget the council had approved in November. Not unless you do a reconsideration motion. And of course, at that time, with the rules the way they were, a reconsideration motion that was less than six months required two thirds majority. There was no appetite from the council at that time, especially from a newbie, to do a reconsideration motion on the previous budget. So I was given the task of, do you agree with this consolidation? Uh, I have no say in the previous budget, and and the numbers are right, right? The the way that you've amalgamated the two, it, it pencils out. So okay, albeit that I'm not happy with it, I'm not happy about the fact that I can't go back and talk about the previous budget. And I mentioned that, but you know what? It didn't matter. I voted for it. Oh, I got roasted out in the community. <laughs> in fact, Mo Amory, who went door knocking with me, uh, one of his longtime supporters called him up and Mo Amory phoned, phoned me after the fact. He goes, Andre, I got to tell you this. This guy who's been a longtime supporter of mine, yeah, you guys just voted on this budget thing and you voted for it. You're, you voted to increase his taxes by, by 3% or whatever it was. And he said to me, Mo, you told me to support this guy. And what does he do? <laughs> First thing he does when he gets elected, he increases my taxes. You lost my support. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm so sorry. I said, but if it's, if it's uh, any consolation to you and to this resident, um, I've had a chance to look at the assessments in that area. And, and just so you know, his, although council approved a 3% tax increase based on his assessment, as it relates to the rest of the property values in the entire city, his taxes are actually going to go down. 
Yeah. It's like, really? Oh, good. I'm going to tell him that. <laughs> I don't know I, if he ever got that guy's boat back, but at least. I have one last talk. question in this segment before we turn to the community. And that question is this, counselor. You talked a little bit about it in that last statement there. The personal and public life of a counselor is quite hard on a municipal level. Provincially, uh, politicians will go up to Edmonton, they represent a larger community, they don't often get uh, hassled at the grocery store. But as a local official, you have people coming up to you on a regular basis, if you're out and about probably saying, why did you vote this way? I need you to fix this pothole. I need you to do this, that and the other. How have you been able to balance that work and personal life? Because I can imagine because you seem like a very engaging person, you seem like a very outgoing counselor who wants the best for their community but i can imagine it gets overwhelming when you have 170,000 people coming to you probably all times when you're out to talk about the important issues that are important to them and you have to sit there and talk about it with them so how have you been able to balance that during your time in office um that's a that's a, a very good question actually um and it's 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 kind of hard to answer all i can tell you is that um, the longer you're in office, the more noticeable you are. And the biggest challenge that I find when I'm out and about is, is not that. I, I have no issue with engaging people 24-7. Um, From my perspective, I was elected to be their representative, to be their voice, and, and I should be available whenever they need me, no matter what time or where I'm at. Uh, I'm never off the clock. I'm always on the clock. And my wife understands that. It's just the way of life, um, at least at a municipal level, because it's so tangible to, to everybody, right? It affects their everyday lives, everything. Um, my biggest challenge that I find is, is trying to manage my time, because um, many times people want to engage me in a conversation, and I have to always be aware of other commitments that I have, because to your point, um, my commitment uh, is in excess of 100 hours a week just to just to do my job, keeping up with the agendas, reading them, be able to debate them, uh, you know, in a, in a from a, a position of knowledge and understanding. And in order to do that, I have to I have to be cognizant of all of the moving pieces that will affect that decision. But while also respecting the need of residents to to want to voice their concerns or their issues. Because part of our oath of office says that, you know, I think it's section 70 of the MGA says our, our role is to listen to our residents and represent their interests to the rest of council to try and, and you know, bring about positive change on the needs of the community as a whole. So for me, it's all about, you know, how can I address this person's needs and while still being respectful of my own you know, requirements to serve the greater community. So there are times I'll enter a conversation with somebody and they want to talk about so many things. And so a lot of times I got to say to them, okay, well, put them in point, point form for me, please. And I'll, I'll just write them down or I'll text myself, send myself a message, and then I'll follow it up. I don't have time to do all of this today or to answer all your questions, but I mean, just take it all down and I'll, I'll get back to you and your phone number and, 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 and whatnot. And, and, course a lot of times a lot of that work gets passed on to my my staff who will then do the legwork for me because i've got other duties and responsibilities that i have to take care of the biggest challenge like i say is trying to manage my time honestly i want to follow up on that a little bit but in a different realm everyone believes their issue is the most important issue and as counselor you have to take all these issues and sort of dissect them but then go to council and vote on issues that are maybe not important to your local count, local award. So there may be a bigger infrastructure project in Ward 3 than Ward 7, than Ward 10, which you currently represent. How do you balance that? Because I can imagine if you don't try to advocate best for your constituents. People are going to say, what are we getting out of this deal, out of this budget? It seems like Ward 3 and Ward 2 and Ward 7 are getting all the infrastructure projects and Ward 10 is getting nothing. How have you been able to balance that? Because sometimes, and I think every councillor will admit, you have to say no, because at the time, the project is not the most important to the city than your pothole in front of your house. 
so the way I've tried to balance that is I look at what is the net benefit to the city, to the city versus the potential negative impacts on my residents. So if I see that there's a great benefit to the city as a whole, and it has a nominal impact on my residents, I will always vote in favor of what is in the greater good for the city. But if I see something that has a net benefit to the city as a whole, but it has a significantly negative impact on my residents, I will always side with my residents. They're the ones who put me here. I'm here to represent their interests. And I think if we truly are, a, 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 if we want to be represented as a true democracy and every one of us represents the interests of our constituents at the table, ultimately the majority will rule the day. And so if eight members of council uh, at representing their interests of their individual communities and the greater need citywide ends up swaying the decision in that direction, then ultimately democracy was fully, um, you know, uh, utilized uh, in making that decision. So that's why I keep saying to other councillors, new, new councillors, I go, you know what, vote in alignment with what your constituents believe without losing sight of what the global you know, need for the city is, like I said, if it has a major negative impact on my residents, even if it does have a net benefit to the city as a whole, I will always vote with my citizens. Well, hello, this is your friendly host of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I have some big news for you. I am pleased to announce that our show has partnered with Strategic Steps Incorporated to launch a brand new show on October 19th. The Political Trenches, Local Government at Work is a new show with a focus on local governments. Each episode, we will discuss the biggest stories from local governments and we will have a roundtable discussion on issues facing local governments today. Follow the news show by searching The Political Trenches on all social media platforms. We are looking forward to discussing local governments and heading into The Political Trenches. Thank you for answering that. And I want to turn to the second segment here because I'm cautious of time here. And that's the city of Calgary as a whole and particularly Ward 10. And before I ask this question, I'm going to preface this question with a statement. This is, a, this is an opinion based on Councillor Chabot's opinion. This is not a decision based on what council is doing. This is Councillor Chabot's opinion. I say that because we've already had a few of these episodes released and people are already sending us emails saying, why is this decision being brought forward to council? It's just the councillor's opinion. And I want to ask this question to you, Councillor Chabot, and that is, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Calgary slash Ward 10 today? Um, well, there's probably several. Um, I guess ultimately, uh, trying to uh, balance uh, people's expectations with the limited uh, revenue uh, that we have available to us as a municipality. As a municipal government, we have limited uh, sources of revenue and, and, and property taxes are primary source of revenue. We do have other sources of revenue and, and some of those sources uh, we are often questioned as to, uh, as to why we're, we're you know, charging residents so much for some of those things and of course they all go towards paying for for the needs of the city as a whole uh and that that is a you know an issue that's going to be citywide with all councillors trying to you know manage expectations meet the needs of our citizens and make sure that our books balance because as a municipal government we can't run a deficit or a surplus we must always balance our books so that is an ongoing never-ending challenge so how are you doing that how are you balancing that expectations for your citizens of ward 10 um, well, I, I'm at, at a bit of an advantage over many of the new councillors in that uh, I know where all the skeletons are, so to speak. <laughs> I, uh, I do know where there are uh, pockets of money that can help to meet some of the needs, the capital needs of my residents, of course. Uh, our biggest challenge is the operating uh, aspect of, of our budget. Uh, but um, as far as trying to meet the needs of my citizens, as far as capital infrastructure requirements, uh, I have uh, you know, maybe greater insight into some of the funding that's available to 
to accommodate that. And so I've been, I've been uh, pushing that agenda since I got reelected, of course. A lot of this stuff is, is things that I've learned over time. And it takes a long time to fully understand uh, the, the complexities of the city of Calgary's financial, uh, and, you know, uh, reserves and revenue streams and what pots are available for what and what legislatively you can use what for what. Um, understanding all of those uh, policies and principles and legislative requirements uh, takes takes a while to get to know. Uh, so I have an advantage in that regards that I can maybe get a greater investment into my area than they may have experienced in the past, while not ne negatively impacting them from a tax perspective. I, I can tell you, I, I live in Whitehorn, which is your reward, as we said at the beginning of this. I have seen over the last year more projects ongoing in Whitehorn that I have in the four years that I've lived in this community. I'm not sure if you're advocating more or if these were always on the pro the, uh, the uh, books, but I can tell you, I drive to Tim Hortons every morning and I go, wow, there's a lot more construction going on around Sir Wilfrid School. There's more projects going on by the Whitehorn uh, Community Center, the new tennis courts updates. And I'm going, okay, maybe there are projects because for the first three years, I was like, is there anything going on? And I couldn't see anything. And yet again, I lived in a bubble of Whitehorn, so it didn't really, I didn't really get to see much, but I can tell you, I'm seeing more infrastructure projects being done here. <laughs> I, I, I can tell you that's been a, a big focus of mine, especially on, uh, on green fields and, and recreational opportunities, uh, 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 playground equipment, um, uh, road resurfacing, um, many of those initiatives that you referred to, uh, to try and get more uh, capital dollars invested into the Northeast. Of course, one of my big pushes right now is, is to look at repurposing some of those green fields to a higher utilization um, uh, purpose. Uh, because you know not everybody's playing baseball anymore, and uh, and many of the the green fields are are open to without any structured facilities. So I'm pushing for more of that into the northeast. Of course, this is probably more capital in intensive than it is operationally intensive. Again, if you can draw on capital dollars specifically from from specific reserves, it's money that we've already collected. You know, people say there's only one taxpayer. Well. You've already paid for this essentially this this money that's in these reserves so why not make use of them as much as possible uh especially for the northeast which i think is has been um, under uh, I, I i guess underserved from a capital investment perspective for a few years so i'm trying to push for more capital investments in the northeast uh, but what i'm lousy at i'll be i'll be frank is communicating that out to the public um, I'm not big on social media. I'm more of a get the job done kind of guy than being out there and proactively saying, oh, wow, see, look, I'm great. Look at all that. Uh, that's not me. And so I guess I'm a lousy politician. I, I, I don't actually consider myself a politician. I consider myself a public servant. I'm here to serve. I want to, I want to ask one last question before we turn to the very last segment. And that is, you are coming up to one year since the 2021 election. Uh, you were elected in 2021 to represent the people of Ward 10. You have one year under your belt as of the airing this. What do you hope to accomplish? And what, what's on your agenda? What, do you, what, what are you going to be pushing forward for the next three years before the next election? Is there anything on your radar that you really want to get done? Well, you know, my mom used to say all the time, uh, don't look in, uh, you know, uh, into somebody else's backyard and go, oh, look at all the weeds in that backyard until you've picked all the weeds in your own yard. Um, so there's a lot of weeds in my yard right now. Uh, and a lot of those weeds need to be cleaned up, uh, including replacement of, of sidewalks that have been uh, broken and pushed up because of poplar trees, uh, looking at replacing some of those poplar trees to other trees that are less invasive. Um, we've managed to amend the bylaw now so that we don't plant poplar trees right next to a, to a sidewalk anymore. Uh, again, that's just, you know minor win, but ultimately with a great pain over time for the city and, and actually getting forestry to look at doing a pilot program in my ward, as well as in Peter DeMong's ward to actually look at replacing as many poplar trees as within their budget uh, and, and sidewalks, and then giving us a report uh, to say, okay, this is what we did, and this is how much we had to work with. How much more do you want us 
you want to see us do because based on our assessment, it's going to take us this many years to do it if we continue down this same path with this amount of money. And so first of all, we need to know how much it's going to cost to fix all the sidewalks. Ultimately, I'd like to get all the sidewalks in the Northeast uh, fixed and repaired and or replaced. Uh, all of those poplar trees replaced with non-invasive type species that don't impact our, our sidewalks on, into the future and, and also moving them further away while still maintaining our, our tree canopy because obviously we want to have trees. You don't you can't take all the, the poplars out at once because then you lose that mature tree canopy. So that's why it has to be done over time. But, but making sure that as we replace those trees, we also fix the sidewalks and put in the, the proper sidewalk. That's just one small thing. Like I said, it's one of those weeds that's in my backyard that's been you know, festering for many years. It's just, we need to get rid of it, uh, but it's gonna take time. But I wanna make sure that all of the, the policies and processes are in place so that even if I'm not here, this will continue on and will ultimately get completely fixed. That's just one thing. The other thing, of course, I mentioned before, green spaces, looking at repurposing many of our green spaces to, to uses that are, have a, a, a higher utilization. Um, we have a very diverse community in the Northeast and it's ever changing. And, and many new immigrants are coming into, into Ward 10 as a first point of entry. And many of them are actually staying there long-term but they have different needs in other areas. Cricket pitches, we, we have very few cricket pitches and it's a, there's a high demand for cricket pitches and yet we don't have them. We have a lot of baseball diamonds that are on a decline as far as utilization. So maybe converting some of those baseball diamonds into cricket pitches is, is one potential option. So park, right now, Parks and Rec is, is undertaking a, 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 a process of reassessing a, a lot of those green fields citywide uh, with a with a, a significant emphasis on the northeast on how to repurpose many of those green spaces uh, and, and then also looking at what are what other uh, equipment may be needed to better service the community and of course transitioning our community into more, something that's more sustainable we talk about building sustainable uh, city and and how we're doing that in a green field and we're trying to redevelop our inner city to to be more of a a 15 minute city as they refer to this so that you can walk to a grocery store or to a or to a, you know other kind of amenities all within a 15 minute walking distance or access without having to get into an automobile and you know as as much as people say oh that's that's so you know futuristic that it's not going to happen in my lifetime there are small things that we can do because right now how far do you have to go to get to even even a convenience store as an example you know, when when we have if we have a higher density population, we could have way more convenience stores in our communities. But you need a critical mass to be able to support that store so it can, can stay in business based on our current densities in the northeast, which is developed at at two to four units per acre. You can't have those 15 minute cities. So we need to look at how we can increase our, our density, our population, but do it sensitively. This is a critical and the most important piece of all is as we increase our density as a city, as a, as a, as a community, we want to make sure that we do it in such a way as that it doesn't force people out, right? If we, if we make too significant of a change in a given community, some people are going to go, wow, this is not what I bought into. I didn't you know, expect this was going to happen next to me. And I'm going to move to Chestermere because in Chestermere, you know what? I'm going to have my single family home. I'm going to have this. I'm going to have that. So we want to do make sure that we do it contextually, sensitively, to, to not push our, our current residents out. We want to add people, not push people away. Strategic Steps works with local municipalities, boards, and school divisions across Canada, providing guidance and expertise in governance, strategy, and sustainability. They work with clients to build on existing strengths, develop recommendations that are practical, sustainable, and strategic, and lead professional development sessions that drive organizational excellence and council and board member growth. From strategic planning to organizational and governance reviews to governance workshops and more, Strategic Steps has the tools, experience, 
and expertise to help your organization reach its goals and set itself up for future success. To book a consultation or learn more about Strategic Steps Incorporated, visit strategicsteps.ca today. I appreciate that. And I am cautious of time here. And I, I, I hope you have five minutes that we can finish this interview off. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, my last segment of the show is kind of a fun segment for myself because I enjoy learning about the communities that my the counselors represent. I live in your community. So I'm, I'm expecting to hear some things that I already know, but I want to know a little bit more. Counselor Chabot, what is a tourist destination in the Ward 10 that if I was a tourist coming to your community, your ward, I have to visit? What are some of the hot spots or the hidden gems in your community that people, tourists, should visit? Uh, well, um, one that uh, is near and dear to me is, uh, is Marlboro Park. And I, I think it's referred to as Big Marlboro Park in, on the, all the maps. I'm not sure how it got that designation, but... Uh, nonetheless, uh, it, it, it's a, a very large field that includes a dry pond and in the winter uh, gets, gets turned into a, a regional rink. Uh, and, and on the northern portion of that, uh, of that park is a, is a, uh, a disc golf. Um, again, a new amenity that's been added there. Uh, there's also a, uh, a tennis court on site. Then, of course, the Marlboro Park Community Association, which, again, uh, is, uh, is a wonderful facility that's uh, just, um, just gotten their, uh, I think, I think to approach their 50th anniversary as a community association, uh, although the building hasn't been there that many years, but it's still, you know, very uh, clean, nice uh, building that's, uh, has a high utilization rate uh, and it's um, very much serves the community as a whole, but it's more of a regional park. Uh, and there, there are areas I have to say, though, slightly outside of my current Ward 10, but one of, one of my favorites for my grandchildren is, uh, is Applewood Park. It used to be in Ward 10, now it's just slightly south. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a fully accessible uh, playground. Of course, Man Mead Buller and I worked on it together to bring that to fruition. Uh, and it uh, essentially is a million dollar park. That's roughly how much money got spent in it. I helped to physically build that park uh, uh, as well as made sure to provide for the land, uh, all the remediation to the land, the gravel, and you know a lot of city works. And of course, the ongoing operating and maintenance of that facility, of course, is a city municipal responsibility now, but that one is, is a gem that not too many people know, but Applewood Park, if you get it, you get a chance to go, even though it's not more 10, uh, my grandkids call it the super park. It's an amazing facility. And again, not more 10 specifically, but uh, every community has very distinct uh, things that they have to offer. Uh, Pine Ridge is an example, has a very active community and, and a very uh, active uh, local pub, if you will. And the same with, uh, uh, so Rundle and Pine Ridge, they, they compete a little bit from that perspective. Uh, and they and they do have you know uh, local uh, uh, play fields as well as uh, um, uh, tennis courts and the thing about War Ten that I can say is and you know, a lot of people are saying well you know we've got all these green fields and they're not not all of them have a uh, high utilization rate but I got to tell you there's so many other communities in this city that would die to have our green fields you know it's like passive recreational opportunity in in a uh, you know in a large area where you can have structured events you can have soccer games you can have baseball games you can you can play cricket although it may not be designed specifically for that it's it's large enough to accommodate soccer and cricket and you know some of those large fields uh, we don't want to lose those you know it's one thing to say we want to repurpose them and and look at providing the infrastructure to accommodate uh, different um, uses, um, I, I don't want to see any of them go away, to be honest with you, because as we increase our population, there will be a greater demand for green fields, not a lesser demand for green fields. And of course, the Mattery uh, Greenway. Um, so they call it the Mattery Rotary Greenway. Uh, I got to tell you, though, of course, myself, Joe Cece, uh, uh, met with uh, the, the Calvary Parks Foundation years ago when we were talking about applying to the provincial government 
to grant us the ability to put a walkway along a transportation corridor. It was not allowed. You could not put a walkway along alongside a major highway. So we got them to change the legislation to allow the Calgary Parks Foundation to work with other donors and and uh, and and supporters, uh, investors to build the Mattamy Rotary Greenway. So that 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 pathway that runs along Stony Trail, uh, councillors, well, Alderman Joe Cici and I um, work closely with the Calgary Parks Foundation to actually make that happen. But I don't expect it to change the CC Shibble <laughs> way anytime soon. <laughs> My last question to for you, councillor, is this. After a stressful day, after a very long day at council, just a lot of meetings, a lot of events, what's one place in the city of Calgary that you can go to that you can just decompress, that you can just let it all go? Is there a park? Is there a restaurant? Is there a unique spot that most people don't know about that you want to tell us about that you can go and just decompress after a long day? Um, well, Village Square, obviously. It's a, it's a facility that's been around for a long time. It's, um, uh, of course, you've got the, the, the wave pool, um, the, the slide, uh, uh, the library there. Um, and of course, uh, again, you know, just to be able to sit down, maybe read a book, and relax, uh, um, you know, just or to go onto the internet, of course, go into Village Square. You've got the two rinks there as well. Uh, I personally I still play hockey. Uh, that's one of my outlets is to go and play hockey. Uh, but I play all over the city, in, in, including Aaron Woods, which <laughs> is no longer a War 10, but it was at one time. And that one, you know, honestly, it's it's near and dear to my heart uh, because when I when my kids were growing up, uh, the wife would take the kids with me. It was kind of an outing for the kids. And they would watch me play hockey, sort of. But, you know, they would play with all the kids from uh, the other hockey players that I played with. And, uh, and again, Aaron Woods Twin Arenas is a, is a great facility, albeit it's in Ward 9. Uh, but you know, rinks in general, uh, Ernie Starr, Bob Bahan swimming pool, uh, again, no longer in Ward 10, uh, 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 Coral Springs. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, Monterey Park, there's a lot of passive recreational opportunities, a lot of pathways uh, in, in Ward 10 that, again, from a passive recreational, you know, just go out and enjoy the weather and, and, uh, and the clear, clear blue skies that we have here in Calgary. There's tons of opportunity for that in the city and uh, i would say enjoy the pathways and, and the green space as much as possible because not every community has those well counselor i want to thank you so much for this last 15 minutes of conversation i have learned more about my counselor in the last 15 minutes that i probably would have in uh, a year that you've been elected but that's the great thing about my show i get to learn as well with my listeners um so thank you so much for doing this my pleasure thanks for having me uh, anytime you want to chat some more, I'm happy to happy to help. We, well, awesome. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down your social media feed for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society. It helps our democracy. And it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. Tomorrow morning, Friday, we will be sitting down with city councillor for the city of Airdrie. Heather Spearman will be with us. So please tune in for another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, Keep talking.